In this video, I'll be discussing how firms distribute their earnings to shareholders. Historically, there have been two main methods for distributing earnings, dividends and stock repurchases. I'll start off discussing the various types of dividends. Then I'll discuss the theories that predict how much a firm will pay in the form of a dividend. Next, I'll introduce dividends and stock splits and the relationship between the two. And then finally, I'll compare and contrast the effects of splits, repurchases, and dividends all together. All right, so let's formally introduce the most well-known form of distribution, the dividend. A dividend is a payment to shareholders by a firm. Most firms prefer to pay cash dividends, but there are some firms that include stock dividends to shareholders regularly. Most large firms issue dividends. Dividends are paid out of cash on hand to the shareholders of record at the end of the quarter. Some firms are restricted from paying dividends based on things like capital requirements or debt covenants. Uh, now, I'll mention a couple of times in this lecture something that I, I want to front run here. And the reason I'm going to do this is because it's so important. And it's this. Dividends are signals. The reason I say this, the reason I say dividends are signals, is because they tell investors about the expected future performance of the firm. When a firm increases its dividend, it's a signal to investors that the firm's future performance is going to be much better than it had been expected to be. And when a firm cuts its dividend, which some firms do, that that is one of the worst, most negative signals a firm can send to shareholders about expected future performance of the firm. All right, let's talk about the types of dividends out there. And there's a lot of types of dividends. Uh, so let's talk about the most common. And the most common is the stable predictable dividend. That's just a name that I am going to refer to it by. There's really just no one name for it. Uh, now, this is our standard quarterly dividend. It's usually a fixed dollar amount. A firm will occasionally increase this dividend as its net income becomes larger. Now, let's take a look at a firm that has a constant predictable dividend. So to do this, I'm going to show you the dividend performance or the dividend payouts of Apple. All right, so I'm in Yahoo Finance right now, and I'll just type in Apple's ticker symbol. And here we go. Here's Apple. And we'll just chart its stock price over the last several months. And in Yahoo Finance, you can see that there are D symbols here. These indicate the dividends that are paid out on certain dates by Apple. So on February 8th of 2019, Apple paid out a dividend of 73 cents per share. Its current share price is $197. Now, if we go backward in time, let's say a year, you can see that Apple has made four quarterly dividends, each of 73 cents. If we go back further, let's say two years, we can actually see that at about this time last year, or about a year ago last year, on February 9th of 2018, the firm's dividend was actually a little less. It was 63 cents as opposed to 73 cents. So we saw this increase in Apple's dividends as it became more profitable. And if we go back further and further and further, you'll see that their dividends become smaller and smaller and smaller. Oh, and there's a share split right there, but we'll talk about those later. All right, the next type of dividend is the residual dividend. And this kind of dividend occurs when a firm determines how much it will need to spend on capital budgeting projects. The remainder of earnings per share is returned to shareholders in the form of this residual dividend. Next, we have the constant payout ratio dividend. Sometimes firms will not set their dividends at a fixed dollar amount, but instead they'll use a percentage of earnings. You might remember the dividend payout ratio, but if you don't, that's not really a big deal. It's up here on uh, the screen. It's just uh, dividend payout ratio is just dividends per share divided by earnings per share. It represents the percentage of earnings that a firm is paying out to shareholders each quarter. Now, occasionally a firm will set a target payout ratio that will mean the actual dollar value of the firm paying out to shareholders 
uh, will change as earnings per share increase or decrease. All right, now let's take a look at a couple of simple examples illustrating the amount a firm will be paying out in dividends to shareholders. In this first example, JetBlue has been growing its dividends at a constant 6% rate for more than 20 years, and this growth is expected to continue into the future. This year, the firm paid $3.50 in dividends per share. How much is JetBlue expected to pay next year? Well, obviously we know our dividend today, or this year, that's $3.50, so that's our D0, and 0 just indicates the time period, so 0 is today. Our growth rate is 6% or 0 0.06. Our D1, our dividend next year, is just going to be that $3.50 dividend today times 1 plus our growth rate of 6%. Therefore, our dividend in year 1 will be $3.71, or is expected to be. All right, in this next example, Ford plans to invest $50 million to expand its operations. The firm is willing to issue $30 million in new debt to cover the, net, the new capital budget, but will need to raise the remainder from internally generated cash. If net income is expected to be $25 million this year and Ford follows the residual dividend policy, what amount of dividends will be paid this year? Well, first, let's identify our inputs. Ford has a $50 million capital budget for this next coming, for this year. It expects to issue $30 million in debt, which means that the remainder needing to be raised via its its internally generated cash is going to be, well, just $50 million minus $30 million, uh, or $20 million. So that means of that $25 million of net income the firm earned over the previous year or is expected to earn over the next year, uh, 20 million of that is going to be used to fund the the firm's capital budget. This means that the firm has the remainder to pay out in the form of a dividend, aka 25 million minus 20 million gives us dividends total of 5 million that'll be split amongst the shares likely equally. All right, the next type of dividend we have is the low regular dividend plus extras. This type of dividend policy is sometimes used by conservative managers to ensure the firm has enough cash flow in bear markets to continue making enough in dividend payments. The firm will set a small quarterly dividend, and if the firm has low earnings per share, then this small dividend is the only one that's going to be paid. If, however, the firm has really high earnings per share, then it'll increase the dividend that quarter and just for that quarter. Now, we uh, we sometimes see this next type of dividend, the special cash dividend, and these dividends are one-time cash dividends when the firm has excess cash and very few good capital budgeting projects. So the firm, rather than letting that cash sit on the balance sheet, they'll just return it to shareholders because they really don't have any better opportunities right now. Now our sixth type of dividend is the liquidating dividend. And liquidating dividends are sometimes seen if a firm enters Chapter 7 bankruptcy, which is liquidation. When a firm enters Chapter 7, the bondholders are going to be paid what they're owed, and the government is going to be paid what they're owed, and occasionally employees will receive uh, wages that they've already earned, uh, but that typically leaves the shareholders getting the short end of the stick. So what happens when a firm enters Chapter Chapter 7 bankruptcy is the shareholders get the residual amount, the, the amount that's left over uh, after everyone else has been paid. And that is where we get this liquidating dividend. It's the amount that you get because the shares you held of the firm that went bankrupt are paying you this, this last dividend, and then they're worthless. Now, finally, we can have stock dividends. And stock dividends are dividends of additional shares of stock to each shareholder. For example, if you own 100 shares and the company declares a 10% stock dividend, then you would receive an additional 10 shares. Now, this is obviously going to increase the number of shares outstanding, which means that in the future, the dividend per share that you'll receive will likely be a touch smaller because the total dividends being paid out by the firm are being split amongst more shares. But we'll talk about that later. All right, now let's talk about the timeline for issuing a dividend. All right, so here I have an example that I'll show you in a second from, actually I'll just show you right now, from Apple. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll show you what happens when a firm issues or announces a dividend. And here's an example. I'll follow the link. Uh, 
And as you can see, Apple reported its fourth quarter results on November 1st, 2018. And so it'll report that its revenue is up 20%, earnings per share up 41%. Uh, and somewhere down here, it's going to report the expected dividend per share that it's going to pay out. Here we go. Apple's board of directors has declared a cash dividend of 73 cents per share of the company's common stock. The dividend is payable on November 15th, 2018 to shareholders of record as of the close of business on November 12th. What that means is if you own the shares of Apple on November 12th, then you will be paid those that 73 cent dividend per share. All right, let's go back to our timeline. So the way most dividends are announced and then eventually paid works something like this, the, the way that Apple's is working out. So let's say on November 1st, the dividend is declared. Declaration date is just the date that the dividend is announced and the firm will announce the dollar value of the dividend. Uh, next will be our X dividend date. And what that means is, whereas we saw that the date of record was 11-12, in this case, uh, what that means is you need to own the shares of Apple stock by November 12th of 2018, uh, just because whoever owns those shares by then, uh, that is who is going to receive the dividend. Now, this X dividend date that happens two days before, this is where the stock starts trading, as we say, X dividend without the amount of the dividend factored into the share price. So. I'll talk about that a little more in a second, but let's talk about our final date. So the date of payment will typically occur a couple of days after the date of record. In this case, it was November 15th. And historically, we would say that's when the checks are mailed out, but nowadays, what that means is really just the, the dividends are going into your brokerage account, and your broker will hold that cash in your in your sweep vehicle, aka your cash account in your brokerage uh, account. Now, if you want to see which companies are making dividends or are about to pay dividends, there's a good website that I recommend, and it's this one right here, the street.com uh, slash dividends. All right, now let's look at what happens on the X dividend day. On the X dividend date, the share price of the firm stock on a stock exchange will be affected by the by the dividend. At the start of that trading day, the shares will open trading with the understanding that anyone buying those shares will not be able to receive the dividend. The reason I say this is because in order to be the owner of record on the date of record, you need to have bought the shares by the X dividend date. At the start of that trading day, the shares will open trading with the understanding that anyone buying those shares will not be able to receive the dividend. Uh, typically, it takes two or two trading days to be declared the uh, owner of record of a given stock when it's reported to the SEC. So the X date is really the date where those dividends stop being factored into the share price. Now, uh, what this really means for us as investors is if the firm's share price was, let's say, $10 at the end of trading day T-1, so at the end of yesterday, uh, and the firm's shareholders were expected to receive a dollar dividend, then the expected opening price per share will be $9 per share. Now, if you've ever looked at the price of a stock on Google or Yahoo Finance on the X dividend day, you might notice that there's no decline in the share price. Uh, the reason you don't see a decline in share price most of the time is because Google and Yahoo adjust their numbers for dividends and stock splits. All right, now there's numerous theories for why a firm would issue dividend. And I'm going to mention the most common. And I should state for the record that there is empirical evidence to justify m actually all of these theories. Uh, although, And there's really no one theory that I have listed here that explains every dividend decision. So some of these theories give us an interesting insight into how investors behave and the factors that determine whether or not a firm will pay a dividend or how much that dividend is going to be. So let's get started. All right, the first theory and the oldest theory is the dividend irrelevance theory of Modigliani and Miller. Yes, that Modigliani and Miller, the guys from the previous lecture. And if you remember that previous lecture on capital structure, 
I mentioned that uh, Miller won the Nobel Prize for capital structure irrelevance. Actually, I think I mentioned that it was Modigliani uh, in that video. That was actually a mistake. But uh, Miller won the Nobel Prize for capital structure irrelevance. Well, uh, Modigliani actually won the Nobel Prize for dividend irrelevance, along with a couple of other contributions a couple of years later. Now, the dividend irrelevance theory works like this. Since a firm can either issue a dividend now or invest it and offer shareholders capital gains in the future, whether the firm has a dividend or not should be irrelevant to investors. Now, obviously, uh, the implication here is that if it's irrelevant to investors, then the share price shouldn't change when the dividends are announced or when they're cut. Uh, in reality, that is not the case, and we have a number of assumptions that don't hold up in this in this theory. Uh, so there's obviously taxes on dividends. Uh, for example, the top the top tax bracket in the United States currently is 20% on dividends. Uh, for the bottom tax brackets, the tax rate on dividends is 0%. Uh, there are also transaction costs for converting stock into cash, and there's definitely uncertainty in the market and in the firm's share price, which Modigliani and Miller don't factor into their uh, their model. Now, because of this, while the theory works, obviously, in theory, empirically, this dividend irrelevance theory doesn't hold up. Uh, Dividend-paying Firms typically have higher valuations than non-dividend paying firms, but it does give us a framework for understanding the basis of firm value with regard to cash flows. The next theory we have is the life cycle hypothesis. This hypothesis indicates that firms have a life cycle. When they are startups, they have no ability to survive if they pay dividends, since they're uh, both investing in capital budgeting projects and they also require large inflows of capital. Sooner or later, they may solely begin to use retained earnings uh, to fund their capital budgeting projects. And then finally, when the firm actually matures and its place in the industry is more certain, the firm's management will start to consider paying a dividend. Mature firms that have stable, positive cash flows are most likely to pay a dividend. You've undoubtedly heard of many of these firms, like Ford, Microsoft, and Apple. In fact, most of the total dollar value of dividends paid in the last several years has been paid by large, mature firms in the S&P 500. One additional reason mature firms make dividend payments is partially due to agency theory, which I'll talk about a little later, but uh, life cycle hypothesis is closely related to agency theory. All right. All right, the next theory we have is signaling theory, or the signaling hypothesis. And a firm that is able to pay dividends is essentially signaling to investors that it has income now, and the managers believe it'll have large positive cash flows in the future, essentially off into perpetuity, forever. Now, firm management knows that initiating a dividend is a positive signal to investors, and cutting a dividend is a negative signal about the firm's future prospects. If a firm has to lower the dividend, this represents poor management. In fact, there's actually a paper out there on the academic side that examines the average decline in share price when a firm cuts its dividends. And the average return around that dividend cut announcement or the elimination of a dividend altogether is negative 7%. Think about that for a second. If a firm cuts its dividend completely, you can expect on average across the entire market, a for every firm that cuts their dividends, a 7% decline in the share price. That's a massive, massive decline in shareholder value, which is why firms really don't like issuing dividends unless they're absolutely certain they can continue to pay dividends in the future. All right, let's take a look at an example of a dividend cut in the real world. All right, so I pulled some data from Kinder Morgan around their cut. And just in case you don't know, Kinder Morgan is an American company headquartered in downtown Houston, Texas, and it's the largest energy infrastructure company in North America. Uh, it actually specializes in controlling uh, oil and gas pipelines and terminals. And when Kinder Morgan announced its dividend cut in early December 2015, this is what happened. So I have the dates on the x-axis here, and I have the share price of Kinder Morgan stock on the y-axis. Uh, 
And this red line represents the date of the dividend cut or the announcement of the dividend cut. So you can see a decline of about 40% in the firm's share price from the month around the announcement of the dividend cut. Uh, so it went from $25 a share on November 24th to about $15 a share later in December, uh, around December 20th or so. And this is often what we see when a firm cuts a dividend. Like I said, it represents a massive negative signal about the firm's future performance over the next several years, so its ability to generate cash flows. All right, the next payout theory is the clientele effect. Now, this theory is based on the idea that some investors like dividends and other investors don't like dividends. If there are more investors in the market that like dividends, then the firm should pay a larger dividend to attract those investors as shareholders, thus boosting the price, since if there's more demand, we would, we would expect the price to rise. And there are many reasons why shareholders would either like or dislike dividends. Uh, for example, individuals in high tax brackets often prefer stocks that pay low dividends or no dividends because dividends come with taxes. So if you can just invest in a stock and then eventually cash out of that stock when you're ready, say about the time you're retiring and just pay capital gains where those dividends that would have been paid out would have been reinvested in the firm, you're better off. On the other hand, individuals in low tax brackets like retirees tend to prefer dividends since they might not be able to uh, earn, say, a living wage. And those dividends that they're earning because those individuals in a low tax bracket are probably not earning a wage, let's say they're, they're older, let's say retirees, they're probably not paying any taxes on those dividends, and those dividends, along with, say, the coupon payments on bonds they might own, might be their only source of income besides uh, welfare funds. All right, the next theory we have is one that I've already talked about with regard to capital budgeting. Uh, it's called agency theory. And just to refresh your memory on agency theory, agency theory involves a principal that owns some asset and an agent who the principal hires to act on their behalf. And there's all kinds of agency theories in finance and management. Uh, board members can act as principals who have the goal of maximizing shareholder value, whereas, let's say, managers act as agents tasked with ensuring shareholder value is maximized. Now, the issue is that if a mature firm builds up too much cash, management might use that cash in a way that's bad for shareholders, like, let's say, buying companies that improve the manager's prestige. It's very prestigious when you as a manager are buying a $10 billion company. You get a lot of press coverage, you might do a lot of interviews, and you might get a lot of uh, praise from other managers around the world. Now, in order to reduce agency costs, the board can impose a regular dividend. And this dividend is designed to take cash out of the hands of the management, thus reducing their ability to abuse that cash. Now, this is a bigger issue in poorer countries outside of the U.S. and countries with weaker accounting regulations. Because, obviously, if there's weaker accounting regulations or there's weaker shareholder rights, the management of that of those firms in those countries might be more able to get away with, let's say, buying themselves a corporate jet that only they can use, or buying a company when they should be investing that in something, some capital budgeting project that offers a higher NPV. All right, the final theory I'll discuss is the free cash flow hypothesis. And this hypothesis states that firms that pay dividends from cash flows that can't be reinvested in positive NPV projects have higher values than firms that retain those same cash flows. The reason for this is that firms that don't pay out excess cash are simply letting that cash go to waste, whereas if it was paid out as cash to shareholders, the shareholders could decide how best to use that cash. Now, there are many extensions of this theory, but the biggest is that unlike some of the other theories, a cut in the dividend could be seen as a positive signal about the firm's growth prospects, since it means that the firm has more positive NPV projects in which it can invest. Uh, so this obviously runs counter to the signaling hypothesis. All right, now there are other well-known phenomena that govern the dividend behavior of firms, and I thought I'd just highlight two of them. First, flotation costs, or the cost of raising funds 
can actually affect the decision of whether or not to pay a dividend. If the firm is in a country where, let's say, the cost of raising new debt or issuing new shares of stock is really high, then that firm might be more likely to not pay out a dividend. The reason for this is you get to keep that internally generated cash and invest it rather than issuing a dividend and then going out to an investment bank and paying the flotation fees that those banks will charge you uh, to raise new money through the issuance of bonds or equity. So it's actually uh, in cases where flotation costs are high, we typically expect firms to use that internally generated cash more frequently. And so the dividends per share or the dividend payout ratio should be smaller when the flotation costs are higher. At the same time, there are some cases where there are dividend restrictions. And the most common of these might be where a firm borrows money from a bank. Let's say a firm goes out and receives a bank loan. A lot of times, those bank loans will come with what are called debt covenants. And a debt covenant indicates that a firm is agreeing to either take some action or not take some action while they are a borrower of this amount of money. And there are all kinds of debt covenants out there. For example, there are some debt covenants that prevent a firm from borrowing any additional cash from another bank. Or, for example, there are debt covenants where the CEO agrees not to receive a pay raise. I mean, there are all kinds of things that can be written into the bond indenture agreement or the, the loan indenture agreement when uh, the firm receives that loan from a, from a commercial bank. There are also covenants that will restrict dividend payments of firms. So let's say a firm receives a loan from a commercial bank, that loan might actually come with a debt covenant that states that the firm is not allowed to issue dividends as long as it has not paid back that loan. That's a very common debt covenant, and it will actually restrict the amount that the firm could pay in the form of a dividend to shareholders. Now, let's switch topics and talk about share splits. Sometimes we call these stock splits as well. Now, Stock splits occur when the firm's management has determined the, sh the firm's share price on a stock exchange is too high. And the common explanation for a split is to return the price to what we call a more desirable trading range. And splits obviously split each share into several shares, each worth a fraction of the original share. For example, let's say we have a, uh, let's say a seven for one split where Apple has determined that its share price is too high. And this actually happened. Uh, I think I might have shown you that earlier when we were walking through Apple's dividends. But on June 6th of 2014, Apple had a share price of $645. And because the share price was fairly high, and if you wanted to buy shares in a round lot, meaning 100 shares, you would have to pay $645 per share times 100 shares, which is out of most investors' price ranges. Uh, so what Apple did was it engaged in a seven-for-one share split, which means that if you own one share of the $645 stock, now you own seven shares of that stock, and each is worth $92 a share, or one-seventh of seven, $645. Uh, we can also have what's called a reverse split, and a reverse split is the exact opposite, where a firm actually takes five shares and combines them into one share. And what that means is if you own, let's say, 100 shares of stock, now at the, after the reverse split of a, let's say, a one for five reverse split, now you own 20 shares of stock that are worth each five times as much as your 100 shares. And I got a good question in a class actually a couple of months ago about what happens if you don't have, let's say, at least five shares. Let's say you only have three shares. Well, in that case, the firm will literally just uh, buy back your shares and you get cash for those, let's say those two or three shares, those uh, residual shares. Let's look at an example of how a stock split works. So Toyota plans to initiate a 10 for one stock split and Toyota's stock currently sells for $650 a share and there are 100 shares. Uh, I will say, unlike that Apple example, this is actually an example I just made up. Uh, if the share split is initiated, how many shares will there be and what will be the price per share? Well, 
Initially, there will be a share price of 650 and we'll have 100 shares. And the market cap will actually be, well, just 100 times 650, so 65,000. After the share split, we're dividing each of those shares into 10 new shares that will be worth $65, or one-tenth of the original price, and we'll have 10 times as many, or 1,000. So the market cap of the firm will be 65 times 1,000, or still 65,000. In other words, share splits or stock splits don't change the market cap of a company. They're really just a way of reorganizing the number of shares a stock has outstanding and the price of that stock. Now, let's take a look at another example that is a little more complicated, and we'll see how share splits differ from dividends, or in particular, stock dividends. So I'm going to move over to Excel now. All right, so I'm in Excel, and here's an example that should illustrate the change in the book price per share for some of these events that I've already talked about. We have a case where we have our base case where there's no stock split or stock dividend, and our share price is going to be $60. Since we have common stock, let's say 5 million shares outstanding with a $1 par value, so in millions, our book value total will be 5 million, and our paid in capital, let's say uh, a par value, the, the amount that uh, those shares cost when they were issued uh, is $1. So that means our, our common stock is worth $5 million in par value, our paid in capital uh, $10 million, and then our retained earnings $285 million for a total common shareholders uh, equity of $300 million. And our book value per share is going to be that $300 million of stockholders' equity divided by the number of shares outstanding, which in this case is 5 million shares outstanding. So since this is in millions, I just divide by 5. And our book value per share is $60. Now, after a two-for-one split, what we have here is a par value that's still the same. Uh, the reason for this is we have 10 million shares, and the par value is now half of what it was because we had a two-for-one split, or $5 million. Paid in capital, the same. Retained earnings, the same. And that means that, obviously, shareholders' equity is going to be the same, $300 million. The difference here is now, because we have 10 million shares outstanding, our book value per share is essentially half of what it was, since we're dividing $300 million by $10 million, because we have 10 million shares outstanding. And that gives us a book value per share of 30 or $30. Finally, we have the case where a firm issues a 20% stock dividend. And when a company does this, this is actually going to raise the, uh, the par value of the common stock. So you had a $1 par value, but now you have 6 million shares outstanding as opposed to 5 million because you're issuing 1 million new shares. So 1 million is 20% of 5 million. Uh, here we have paid in capital of $99, and then we have, uh, or $99 million, and then retained earnings of $195 million. And so our common shareholders' equity is still going to be $300 million, uh, but our book value per share is going to be a little different. It's going to be that $300 million divided by the new $6 million total shares. So in this case, uh, we just get a book value per share of $50. So you can see that depending on which method we use, we can actually alter the book value per share. I mean, a two for one stock split adjusts the share price uh, way down, it cuts it by half, whereas a 20% stock dividend actually decreases the book value per share by, uh, by one sixth. All right, so let's get back to the lecture. All right, now let's talk about the other way firms distribute cash to shareholders, and it's called a stock repurchase. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as a stock buyback. It occurs when a firm uses its own cash to buy back its own shares, and it does this in three main ways. First, it does this through an open market purchase, where the firm will buy back its open 
buy back its shares on the exchange where those shares are traded. So the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange or say maybe the, the London Stock Exchange or some other exchange where its shares are trading. The next method is through what's called a tender offer where a firm will put out an announcement to shareholders that it's willing to pay a premium to buy back its own shares. So let's take a look at an example of this. All right, so in this example, WebMD is announcing a tender offer to buy back up to 2 million of its own shares at a share price of $55 per share. And at the time that this announcement was made, I'm willing to bet that its share price was slightly below that $55. Uh, actually, it actually it says that here its share price at the close of the previous day was $53.83. So WebMD is making a tender offer to buy back its own shares for more than they are currently trading for in order to incentivize investors to sell their shares to WebMD. Uh, so there are a lot of reasons why a tender offer might be made, uh, but usually a firm will have excess cash or it might see its shares as undervalued. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about those in a second. All right, the final method of repurchasing shares is through the use of a targeted repurchase. And this is one of the most popular takeover defenses that we see in the real world. If you want to see an example of this, here we go. All right, so Starboard Value last week sent a letter to Yahoo's board of directors announcing its intention to ask shareholders to replace the entire board. Uh, so Starboard is what we sometimes refer to as an activist investor. Now, an activist investor in the world of investments in, in the world of investments is an investor that takes a usually a, a what we call a foothold investment or maybe a slightly larger investment. So, a foothold or a toehold investment is typically an investment in about let's say five percent of the equity of a company, and it might increase that percentage of the share the firm's equity. And the reason it would do this is to start making changes in the firm's board and then eventually in the fir in the firm's operations. So if it can get a someone that it ex it trusts on the board, that individual, that new board member can start to make changes to, let's say, the corporate governance of the firm, or they might be able to help replace the CEO with a new CEO that the activist investor or the activist fund believes is more appropriate or better qualified to run the company. Now, the reason I mention activist investors is because a lot of times the the funds that are receiving these targeted repurchases are activist investors. In other words, a firm or a firm's management really doesn't want to be the subject of or the target of an activist investor. So what a lot of times will happen is the firm will reach out to the activist investor and offer to repurchase their shares, usually for a premium on the market price. And so this is a very common phenomenon. The, the idea being that by paying this investor this cash, and uh, this, this firm will be able to avoid any changes in, let's say, the board or the management team. It's it's essentially a way to prevent a takeover attempt by this this activist investor or some corporate raider. Now, let's talk about the differences between dividends and repurchases. So, I have a very simple example here to illustrate the difference between a dividend and a repurchase, and the example is from uh, Microsoft. And in this example, we have two possibilities. Let's say Microsoft currently has, in both scenarios, 8.77 billion shares outstanding, and its market cap is 245 billion, or 245.56 billion, and its share price in both cases is 28 cents per share. Now, let's say Microsoft has an, a, let's say, uh, extra cash that it wants to return to shareholders. There are really two main ways that it can return that cash to shareholders, either through the use of a dividend or by repurchasing its own stock. 
and we'll say that it's going to repurchase its stock on the open market for a uh, fair share price, uh, $28 a share. Now, if the firm issues a dividend, and what that means is it will pay out $8.77 billion, so $1 per share, the end result of this is that Microsoft will now be worth what it was in terms of market cap minus the $8.77 billion. In other words, its share price or its total market cap fell by the amount of the dividend. And the end result here is that because you've paid out $1 per share, the share price has fallen from $28 a share to $27 a share. Now compare this to the repurchase. So with the repurchase, uh, the firm is repurchasing, let's say, uh, let's say it's using that same $8.77 billion in cash to repurchase shares. And it's repurchasing about 313 million shares, which is what it could get at $28 a share uh, for $8.77 billion. Well, the end result is that Microsoft is now worth a little less. It's worth, well, its original market cap minus the amount that it paid out to repurchase shares, $236.79 billion. Now, notice here that the market cap, regardless of how the firm pays out that cash to shareholders, either through a dividend or through repurchase, is identical. In other words, the method of distributing that cash shouldn't affect the market cap of the company. The big differences come in when we look at the share price and the number of shares outstanding. So with the dividend, share price fell by $1, but with a, mar with a share repurchase, the share price hasn't fallen at all. It's the number of shares that have fallen. So uh, Microsoft now has, a, well, it had 8.77 billion shares outstanding. Now it has about 8.457 shares outstanding, which is just this 8.77 billion minus this 313 million shares that were repurchased and then canceled. So that's the big difference between a repurchase and a dividend. One decreases the share price and the other decreases the number of shares outstanding. Although, uh, just as a side note, you don't ever have to remember this, uh, but sometimes firms, uh, when they do buy those shares back, they might hold them as what's called treasury stock and not cancel them. So they can use those shares to pay out to employees over time. You might be wondering why you've probably not heard of stock repurchases before this lecture. Well, repurchases have only been popular in the last 35 years, and they're popular and their popularity is rapidly increasing. Uh, the reason for this is because prior to 1984, repurchases were viewed by the SEC as stock price manipulation. Now, as you just saw, repurchasing shares allows a firm to distribute cash to shareholders while keeping the share price high. Uh, the SEC, prior to 1984, saw this as, uh, well, an illegal act. You're manipulating the share price to keep it high. Now, in 1984, however, where this red line is, there a, a law called the Model Business Corporation Act was revised, making it harder for shareholders to sue the firm for stock price manipulation. Since then, repurchases have become the main method for firms to distribute cash to shareholders. As you can see, this dotted line right here represents repurchases, and this line right here represents dividends. So this ends around 2005. Uh, since then, repurchases have increased tremendously while dividends have not increased as much. But the main takeaway here is that dividends are now, they represent a smaller total dollar value of cash being returned to shareholders than repurchases do. Now let's discuss some of the differences between dividends and repurchases that we haven't talked about yet. All right, so I'll go row by row. So first off, uh, let's talk about the timing of these two methods of, re of returning cash to shareholders. With dividends, the investor doesn't control the timing or the size of the cash flow. In other words, the firm sets the dividend and tells you when you're going to receive it. With a repurchase, the firm is telling investors we're willing to buy back shares at a set price and you can decide whether or not you want to sell your shares to us at that set price. So there's a little more flexibility with repurchases. Now, in terms of taxation, uh, dividends are going to either be taxed as ordinary income, depending on 
when you receive those dividends or qualified dividends. Uh, whereas repurchases are only taxed if the investor sells their shares to the firm and then realizes a capital gain. In other words, the share price increased during the holding period when you own those shares. So let's say you bought your shares for $50 and sold them to the firm in a repurchase for $60, you owe capital gains tax on that additional $10 of capital gains that you, you received. All right, now let's talk about the information content between these two. So I know I've said that dividends are signals, but repurchases can also be viewed as signals. Now a dividend is a signal that the firm might have too much cash on hand to invest effectively. In other words, it doesn't have any good capital budgeting projects that it can invest in, invest in right now. Now a repurchase might signal that the firm just wants to return a small amount of cash that it has sitting on its balance sheet right now uh, to, to investors. So this dividend signal is a much more long-term signal, much more impactful signal uh, to investors, whereas this typically means, oh, the, the firm just uh, underestimated the amount of cash it was going to receive, the amount of earnings per share it was going to have, and it's just going to return that money to shareholders. Next, dividends signal long-term increase in cash flows. Whereas repurchases signal that the management might believe that the current share price is too low. Uh, now, this second point of dividends, this is arguably the most important signal that dividends provide. They tell us as investors that this firm, its management expects the firm to be viable and have positive significant cash flows for the next several periods at the very least. It's a very, very strong signal about future expected performance of a firm. However, repurchases, when a firm re announces that it's going to repurchase its own stock, uh, this repurchase announcement is often seen as something that's a little more temporary. And the reason for this is this repurchase, it's a one-off. It, it only happens today or whenever the firm announces the repurchase. A firm is not regularly repurchasing at the end of every quarter. So there are a couple of reasons why a firm would repurchase. I know I've already said that it could represent a short-term increase in cash, but it could also mean that the firm uh, firm management believes that the shares are underpriced. In other words, uh, if you have excess cash and you have nothing better to do with it than buy back your own shares, you're only going to buy back your own shares when you believe those shares are undervalued. That way you get a good deal in buying back your own shares. And so repurchases are often seen as a very positive signal about the uh, returns or the expected future returns of a stock because a firm's management that has all the information you can possibly have about the firm, uh, they know what the intrinsic share price of their stock should be. And so when they're buying back shares, that's a pretty good indication that perhaps the share price is uh, lower than it should be. Finally, a decrease in the dividend payment leads to a large decrease in the share price. Uh, I've already said this multiple times. This is a very negative signal when a firm decreases its dividend. Uh, so like I said, the average return around that announcement to shareholders is historically been found to be about negative 7%. It's, it's a massive negative signal to shareholders about the future performance of the firm. Whereas with a repurchase, Failure to repurchase shares doesn't cause the share price to fall. I mean, investors are never really expecting a repurchase announcement. It just kind of happens. I mean, if a firm fails to repurchase shares this quarter, the share price is not going to fall off a cliff. I mean, it's instituting a repurchase policy as opposed to issuing dividends regularly means that the firm has a lot more flexibility in determining when and how it pays out that cash to shareholders. All right, now let's summarize what we covered. First, I introduced the types of dividends that exist in the real world. Then I discussed the theories that predict dividend payouts, and I mentioned that there's no one theory that explains dividend payouts more than the others. There's actually evidence to support all the theories that I mentioned, and there is a variety of dividend payout levels that are used by firms. And those payout ratios will actually vary through time as, let's say, the expected agency costs of a firm 
raise or lower, or let's say uh, different clientels become apparent in the market. You know, currently uh, there are more dividend loving investors in the market than there were 10 years ago. That might change the amount or the, the payout ratio that firms are paying to investors. Next, I mentioned that managers are very reluctant to cut dividends. And this is because dividends are long-term signals to investors about the firm's future cash flows. And then finally, I discussed repurchases and the differences between repurchases and dividends. Uh, repurchases, as I mentioned, are far more popular and more commonly used by U.S. firms than dividends are nowadays, and that trend is only going to continue. So with that, I'm going to conclude, and if you do have any questions, please feel free to email me or call me or stop by my office hours. I'll look forward to hearing from you.